So good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone. Um, we're going to start this uh, new uh, uh, webinar on epilepsy surgery technique. Uh, we have for today an exciting discussion on laser ablation. Uh, I don't think that uh, we need uh, much introduction of our lecturers. They're both well known to the community. Uh, we have both uh, Needing and uh, Bob that are going to share their knowledge and expertise uh, with us. We are very excited. Uh, we would start uh, uh, with uh, Needing. Needing is a professor and vice chairman of neurosurgery at the University of Texas UT Health in uh, Houston. And he's going to speak on uh, LEAT for temporal lobe epilepsy, why, how, where, and when. Uh, please, Nathan, go ahead. Thank you, Arthur, and uh, thanks, Guy, for inviting me to this, uh, for uh, uh, facilitating this, and uh, thanks also to Jorge for uh, being part of the organizing panel for this. Um, so my charge was to try to introduce laser ablation to you all as a group and, and to put in perspective our experiences with um, uh, ablation of the hippocampus for epilepsy. I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen here. Great. So <clears throat> we all understand that uh, the temporal lobe is crucial for various types of temporal lobe epilepsies. And this goes back of course, uh, at this point, almost 80 years. Um, as you, many of you may or may not know, when Wilder Penfield first started doing temporal lobe resections for epilepsy, he assumed that the onset of seizures was lateral. And several patients were treated with temporal polar and neocortical resections. And they did get better. Some even became seizure free, but the vast majority continued to have seizures. And then sort of in desperation, they put electrodes on the uncus and noted that there were actually frequent discharges and electrographic seizures in many individuals. And further that stimulation of the um, amygdala and of the hippocampus could produce seizures with automatisms and amnesia. This is that famous 1954 drawing that really implicates the uncus and the mesial temporal lobe structures in in temporal lobe epilepsy. We will understand and know the hippocampus. Uh, sometimes it's puzzling to see where the seahorse lies, but uh, yeah, this is important as we'll get into. Uh, the mesial structures, the hippocampus, are complicated in their anatomy with a head of the hippocampus, a body, and a tail. And this follows generally an arc-like shape, but the vast majority of the volume of this tissue lies in the anterior uh, two thirds or so of the uh, entire length of the structure. And of course, there've been many, many anatomical publications talking about how this operation gets done well. Uh, the classical type of patient that we see is something like this, a patient who has a clear mesial temporal atrophy and signal change corresponding to it. Um, and these patients are then uh, usually subjected to, in classical terms, a um, anti-temporal lobectomy and amygdala hippocampectomy. And in the context of temporal lobe epilepsy, without such changes, they're subjected to subdural grid evaluations and increasingly globally SEEG evaluations. The traditional temporal lobectomy technique removes temporal neocortex, generally sparing the superior temporal gyrus, and then in, including the parahippocampal gyrus and the mesial temporal structures, the amygdala and the hippocampus. I'm not going to belabor this. You all understand this. this the only point to this is just to make the uh, an advocacy for the fact that uh, there are distinct constituents of temporal lobe epilepsy. And it is important to know whether those constituents are lateral or whether they are here as in medial, the hippocampus, or if they are in the amygdala, uh, as shown here. We often don't know. 
And the reality is that in most cases that present with hippocampal sclerosis, we're actually slightly uncertain where the exact location of seizure focus is. And we make an educated guess that it is in the hippocampus and it is in the hippocampus and the amygdala alone. So this has been the traditional way of dealing with this disorder. Uh, this was my first patient, one of my first patients that I operated on about 15 years ago. Um, this is her right-sided temporal lobectomy. My hippocampal resections were very small in those days. Now it's usually three and a half centimeters that I take out in one block. But in those days I was just doing about two and then the rest was aspirated in pieces. Um, and so uh, her fiance proposed to her in the recovery room, they got married and all as well. We know that this operation works very well. We know that this has been proven in a randomized prospective trial. Very few things we do in neurosurgery have such level one data. There was also a second trial that tried to advocate for early intervention for temporal lobe epilepsy. And that trial was terminated early for in for uh, low accrual rates, but still showed, and this is the ERSET trial, that early surgery for mesial temporal sclerosis was far more effective than epilepsy surgery. We also know that the numbers that we need to treat are way superior to anything else that is in, in the surgical literature. You need to do 45 carotid endarterectomies to prevent one stroke. The same is true, of course, for stents in the carotid. 25 bypasses to prevent one death at 10 years, but only two temporal lobectomies to have a meaningfully improved quality of life. And of course, there is also an impact on death, like SUDAP in people with epilepsy, but that has not well been quantified yet what the impact of surgery on SUDAP is. Um, but further, epilepsy surgery, especially for temporal lobe epilepsy, results in vastly improved socioeconomic conditions. These are just in direct costs that are much lower at 10 years for the cohort of people that undergo epilepsy surgery than those who do not. As you can see here, if you have an intractable epilepsy, and these are data from 2012 to 2014, the costs of intractable epilepsy are approximately 20 grand. And this was uh, you know, seven years ago, so you might imagine that it's probably closer to 30 or 35 grand in the US today. So it's not surprising that if you put someone with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy through a procedure that they will likely improve and do well um, and that this will result in a much lower societal burden. Yet of course epilepsy surgery is underutilized, vastly underutilized. The estimates are globally it's about six to seven percent of the patients that require epilepsy surgery actually get it. There's a lot of reasons for this, but I'm going to focus not on the infrastructural or on the referral or on the uh, building of institutions problems, but more on the concept of what, what is the driver from a patient perspective, which is the fear of surgery and this idea that all of my brain is important and what do you mean you're going to cut out something? This is also, of course, tempered. Our enthusiasm for, for such procedures are tempered by neurology um, evaluations of our own patients, which show that there are a substantial constituent of our patients who are what we call double losers, people whose epilepsy continues and now they have a cognitive deficit that they did not have. And yes, it's maybe less than 10% of the total group, but of course, this does not mean that we shouldn't think more closely about what we do. And so our era, this era, is the era of minimally invasive procedures, innovations in localization and functional preservation, and expanding the therapeutic reach of curative epilepsy surgery. And that is the context in which I would like to introduce laser ablation to you all. <clears throat> so laser ablation is, is not very conceptually challenging. It's a cooled laser catheter that is stereotactically inserted inside the brain, that is combined with real-time MRI thermal mapping that monitors heat within the target and adjacent to the target. And that measure of heat is plugged into a little equation which estimates how long a piece of tissue has been at a given temperature. That 
time temperature curve is then used to derive whether or not that tissue is now necrotic, is now killed, and whether that goal of destroying it has been accomplished. We use a small little bolt such as this, with a fiber going through it, uh, a little cart of this sort that uh, comes to the MRI machine, um, and stays outside, of course, the, um, uh, the magnetic fields, and um, we watch in real time as the ablation gets done. What we are trying to accomplish is ablation around this temperature, between 45 and 60 degrees. Because if we get too high, it's instant, and that tissue is, is, is destroyed before we can really monitor its destruction. And so uh, that may be fine in some regions of the brain, but for the for most part, we try to have a moderated destruction of tissue by lowering the intensity of the laser um, energy. A little more detail of what this looks like. So this probe and this, I am illustrating the product from Medtronic, the Visual Ace product. I, Monteris, of course, also makes a, a product that is very similar. Um, and they also have a way of uh, uh, using it for laser ablation of the hippocampus. But my experience has been restricted so far to the Medtronic product. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And further, I would say that the, there's a larger amount of data uh, for uh, the use of this product than of the other. And so we have a little more definitive uh, and consistent information. So a laser of 980 nanometers is placed at the end here. This laser fiber comes out from the back end of this. And then there are two tubes for saline irrigation, one for putting the saline in through the inner channel that goes right next to the laser fiber, goes to the end, cools everything, and comes back out. So these two ports are connected to the same sheath, and this coaxial um, cylinder essentially has this innermost lumen for the laser, and then two lumina for inlet and outlet of saline. And then of course the outermost protective silastic sheath. In my estimate, we can try to use this uh, laser to try to get larger targets, but I have a hard time reliably getting beyond eight millimeters. Uh, I've been lucky as much as 12 millimeters sometimes, uh, which means the 24 millimeter diameter structure can be ablated. But that is important to also consider that you often do not get past 16 millimeters width, so eight millimeter radius uh, around each of these probes. And so if you have a particularly large target to ablate, it may be necessary to have multiple probes or maybe you should reconsider whether or not this is a appropriate use of laser ablation. There are many ways, of course, that this fiber can then be placed inside the brain. I still use the frame because I believe that it is um, uh, precise in my hands and accurate more than uh, the robot is. Um, and I don't use the clear point system. I think Bob might talk about that. That is certainly a uh, very, very good alternative, uh, maybe superior in some ways where you can remedy um, tracks um, that are suboptimal in real time. Um, so this is uh, using a T-handle and a, and a PMT bolt to insert into the skull. Um, and uh, you can use the, that metal bolt or you can use the, the, uh, the, the bolt pro 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 provided by Medtronic. And either way, once you finish that, you then insert this uh, probe. Um, I just you know, always routinely get fluoroscopy for this. And then for targets that are small or patients where I am uh, less than happy with, uh, with how the process went, I will also get an O-arm and obtain an O-arm uh, spin to co-localize that implanted trajectory with the actual plan. So of course, once the laser is in there, it can be then used to ablate structures like we've talked about, and we'll get into some more detail about this. Um, and this is just to make a point that others might might uh, break, might think about is, is uh, in, in Europe for a long time, there has also been radio frequency ablation, nothing wrong with it. It's just important to recognize that radio frequency ablation tends to create a, a larger transitional zone of partially damaged tissue, 
and because of the electrical conductivity of tissues being a little less homogeneous uh, than light transmission through them, tends to be less regular. Whereas with laser ablation, the transition zone is much smaller. And so the, the, the areas that are damaged but not destroyed tend to be smaller. So this is why we use laser over antitemporal lobectomy. It increases the surgical therapeutic window. It minimizes neurological and cognitive risks associated with the collateral damage of traditional antitemporal lobectomies, and it maximizes damage to the target. It also decreases surgery-associated morbidity uh, with pain and suffering being diminished, length of stay being diminished, and then perhaps it increases accessibility. And this was my point about utilization of epilepsy surgery. For patients unwilling to undergo epilepsy surgery, there's a higher chance of seizure freedom compared to medical therapy. And for patients willing to undergo open resections, a potentially less complicated option, albeit with a possibly lower seizure free rate. So this is one of my first patients, maybe the first patient that I had um, um, uh, about seven or eight years ago at this point, a uh, 52 year old uh, with a 25 year old uh, history of complex partial seizures, left-sided indirectal discharges, left-sided ictal onset, no grand mal seizures, verbal IQ of 115, performance IQ of 125, he declined a temporal lobectomy due to concerns of naming and a memory deficit. And as you can see, the atrophy is pronounced. This is how the probe looks when it's placed, uh, in the uncus as well as in the hippocampal structures. And then here is in the scanner, we start at the amygdala and deliver laser heat there. And this propagates the mesial temporal structures. And then we pull it back serially and keep pulling this back so that we keep producing a cylindroidal, near, uh, nearly cylindrical um, ablation volume. This is now in the body of the hippocampus. This is uh, the body becoming the tail. And then once we reach the vicinity of the colliculus, that's good enough and we stop. And then this is what this looks like in, uh, in uh, the same plane uh, once contrast is, is administered to show you that the uncus has been well ablated. And it's not uncommon for this ablation to, to conform to the shape of the uncus and the hippocampus. Uh, and that's because of the CSF, both medial and lateral and superior to the ablation that carries the heat away and allows for um, the surrounding structures around the ependema to not be ablated, to not be destroyed, and restricts the heat that is lethal to these mesial structures. This patient is now 80 months out, and he's been seizure-free, and has been doing really, really well. It is important, of course, for us as we design this trajectory to recognize, like I showed you earlier, that the hippocampus is indeed very curved and has unequal volumes in different constituents. And it's important for us to relate this uh, MRI image to the targets that we know are involved from a uh, histological and from a uh, pathophysiological standpoint in the epilepsy, especially the CA1 and CA3 and 4 regions of the hippocampus. So this is where they lie. And then of course, we can target this in different ways, and I'm not pretending that I know for sure which trajectory is the best. This is clearly one way of doing this and doing this well. As you can see, most of the mesial structures are well targeted uh, this way, but you could also increase the heat. So if you go from a lower heat in the medial, uh, enteromedial ablation in the vicinity of the amygdala to a larger ablation, you would get more volume there. And if you came from a slightly more, more longitudinal trajectory to the long axis of the, the hippocampus, you would get more of the posterior hippocampus with this approach than you would with the other. Um, and this is really, there is a learning curve to this. There is a expertise, if you will, that builds up with time of knowing what you can get away with and how much ablation you can carry out at different components of the length of the hippocampus. My own 
perspective on this is that you can, as long as this probe is not too medial and not abutting the cavernous sinus, not abutting the cisterns too closely, you can turn it up to almost full intensity the 50 of the 15 watt laser and make a large ablation zone here that gets all of this medial temporal lobe and the uncus. And then this more longitudinal trajectory will allow you to get the body, the tail, uh, most satisfactory. Um, another similar example, just to illustrate the point of the, of the resistance of people to epilepsy surgery, similar story to the last one, so I won't go into too much detail. Very bright guy, NASA engineer, came to see me, had MTS, decided not to have surgery because he wanted his job, kept it and wanted to not have a decline, smart guy. He got married, had a son, realized his wife would not leave him alone with a child, couldn't take the child to the park, couldn't do anything. Around the same time, the VNS that he had, had placed uh, died and he came back in and had this laser ablation, very similar to the other case. But I wanted to show you this, that this is how this lesion grows and follows the shape of the hippocampus. And so he's slightly more than six years out now and he's still working on discharging plasma from the space station. As you can see, his IQ took absolutely no decline. So the real question though is why is this? Why, what is the problem that temporal lobectomy produces? And can we even do temporal lobectomies better than we've done in the past? Is there a way that we can learn from our laser experience and influence traditional operations too? And a big question that has come up for a long time is why do people with temporal lobectomies have naming declines? Why is their language impaired? And we refer to this as semantic memory, the concept memory, and accessing these systems, which are shown here in red, are thought to be the reasons why a temporal lobectomy causes this type of decline. Note, there is no involvement of a superior temporal gyrus that we all hold as the holy grail not to be touched in a temporal lobectomy. And this schema from Jeff Binder published uh, about 10 years ago was slightly conjectural. So based on Damasio's idea of semantic integration nodes, we thought we would evaluate this. And we did this in, in about um, 70 patients with intracranial electrodes. These are epilepsy patients. Uh, you can see the, the electrodes in these various locations. You can see the heat map of where all the recordings were. This is, of course, both grids and SEGs. This is about equal numbers, about 10,000 electrodes, equal numbers of grids and SEG. And we probe them by trying to access semantics by giving them auditory cues as well as visual cues. So we could show them a picture of an apple or have them hear around red fruit and they'd have to come up with the word apple. What that kind of task does is allows us to dissociate which are the areas that are purely involved in articulation and which are the areas that are not involved, for example, in uh, visual or auditory processing of the inputs that lead to that sort of response. I won't belabor signal processing, except to say that what we're really interested here is in the gamma band the uh, gamma band is thought by many to hold the key, if you will, to cognitive processes. We'll also skip through all of this. We created ways years ago of being able to integrate data across large cohorts, uh, in this case, 70 individuals, um, to accommodate for unequal coverage in different areas, in different people, as well as in different uh, amplitude of activations. To show, and I'll skip this slide, to show this, is really where this lexical semantic access lives. In Broca's area, a little bit in P, in posterior uh, temporal lobe, and then largely in the anterior uh, fusiform cortex. An area, of course, that Luder is described as the site for confrontation naming deficits uh, and uh, has, has been studied and characterized for a while, but I think it's criticality for this process has not been well understood. And, and this is how one could represent this, is that you know here are scrambled images where you're looking at just something that you can't really name, picture naming, 
naming to definition, listening to garbled speech. And this process of lexical semantic integration, this purple region, this, these three foci are the ones that do so, okay? And so it is really damage to this, the temporal lobectomy that causes the naming deficits that we encounter. This would be, of course, still conjectural with ECOG, except that just very recently, Jeff Binder followed this up by doing a, uh, a study in uh, patients with uh, undergoing temporal lobectomy. It's called the FATES study, multi-center prospective uh, fMRI data collection. And luckily for him, very luckily for him, the field was no longer just doing temporal lobectomies. What that does is it creates cohorts that are very varied uh, in the kinds of lesions that have been produced. And so here you can see there are temporal lobectomy people, there are laser people, and uh, there is a technique in the stroke literature and in the lesional literature that has been around for a long time. Of course, this is how Broca decided that Broca's aphasia was produced by damage to the inferior frontal gyrus, which by the way, is actually a fallacy. Just so you all know, it's really caused by damage to the subcentral cortex, white matter and insula, but that's a different point. The um, uh, technique of relating lesions to deficits has evolved substantially. And this voxel-based lesion symptom mapping technique now shows that exactly the same area that we published in the brain paper with Forsyth et al. in 2018 is exactly the area. This is, of course, uh, the convention that uh, is not radiological. It's the anatomical convention. So this is, this is uh, the same region in the left temporal lobe, the anterior fusiform, mid and anterior fusiform gyrus that is critical for creating a deficit in naming. So <clears throat> we've been doing laser ablation now for a while. This is Bob's uh, first paper on this. This is the follow-up that he then published a few years ago, um, showing that we had good outcomes uh, with uh, laser ablation. And I'm gonna just take about two or three more minutes, Arthur. I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit over. Um, I'm gonna actually jump through. This is our experience as well. And there's varied you know, uh, data from each site. Um, with different outcomes, obviously favoring people with mesial temporal sclerosis, not favoring those with uh, non-lesional mesial temporal epilepsy, but suggesting that the use of SCEG to localize seizures, the mesial temporal lobe would be better than just ablating the mesial structures without knowing for sure that they were involved in the onsets. We can then of course also estimate, and I only throw this out there because you'll see this again in a bit from other groups, you can parcelate the brain and identify which con constituent of the temporal lobe is <clears throat> ablated to what extent. Um, this was from our, I'm sorry. Can you see this still or? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Arthur, am I okay? Yeah, you have uh, five more minutes. Uh, if okay, you good, but you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm sorry, what I don't know what happened there, so it just kind of froze up. Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, from our own data, similar to what Binder's study suggests that, and and uh, what uh, uh, Bob has published previously, and Dan Drain has published previously, is that the decline really in uh, uh, mesial temporal ablations lies only in the memory domain. So there is still a decline. And this is important to remember. Laser ablation does not mean that it's a free ride. A substantial proportion of patients will still have a decline in immediate uh, and uh, short-term memory. Um, we haven't found much alterations in non-dominant temporal lobe, although there may be some, according to Dan, in, in uh, naming of uh, famous and, 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 uh, and uh, familiar people. We've also shown that visual deficits with um, temporal lobe ablation are much less common than with temporal lobectomy. Turns out that if you do a temporal lobectomy, there's a 60% chance of getting a, a quadrant anopsia, more or less. And in our series, it's less than 25% or 20%. And that favors the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is worse for 
producing deficits, perhaps because of the, uh, the orientation of Myers loop. We also have found in our uh, series, and we wait for others to replicate this, that the deficit tends to hug, hug the vertical meridian. We call this an octant anopsia rather than a full quadrant anopsia. And this work is also published, so I won't belabor it too much. I'll move very quickly into the large analyses that many, uh, that two groups have done, uh, in, uh, incorporating data from many sites. This is from uh, Cheng Wu uh, at, uh, uh, at Jefferson, and uh, he compiled 234 patients from various centers and suggested that it is the mesial structures, the hippocampal head and the adjacent amygdala whose incomplete ablation is responsible for failures. Um, not, not absolutely cut and dry data, but definitely with a series this large, very reasonable and, and possibly uh, a, a, the reason why these, these procedures may not work. Very recently, uh, the Mayo group performed a meta-analysis um, that shows that the seizure-free rate for people with mesial temporal sclerosis uh, who undergo laser ablation is 66%, and those without laser ablation uh, is, is smaller. They also point to a significant complication rate of between 17 and 22%. Um, now, we've been lucky so far, uh, and our numbers put at our center are lower, but certainly this is something to watch and to consider. Um, these are just the uh, seizure free rates at different places. <clears throat> and here are his takeaway points of what various sites have suggested. MTS seemed to have seizure recurrence earlier, no correlation with laser ablation volume, must prioritize amygdala, also include hippocampal head, parapicopal gyrus, and rhinal cortex, um, and so on. And, and various uh, groups, uh, the findings are sort of almost internally contradictory. Ablation volumes do matter, they don't matter. Um, the, how much you, you know, here you can see it doesn't matter. So, so it is a little bit uns, uncertain. And of course, many of you know that the slate study with uh, Medtronic is ongoing and hopefully that study might help answer the question of what is actually uh, the cohort and the uh, approach that enables this to occur well. Because I think it's both selection as well as the, um, uh, the technique. A uh, few more papers that also talk about this. I will say that there is a little bit of old wine and new bottles here. Serotactic amygdala hippocampectomy has been around for a long time. This is the original Barrett and Bloom paper. This is the RF paper from uh, the Czech group. This is uh, a meta-analysis of selective laser ablation, selective resections, which uh, showed, of course, that the odds of seizure freedom with a selective amygdala hippocampectomy are generally smaller. And it raises the question of whether what we are doing is too good to be true. We are not targeting, we're not targeting the entire network. We're not considering all the pathways connecting the hippocampus and the temporal lobe to itself. We do believe, of course, that the ablation volumes matter, the targets matter, but how much do they matter? And what are the critical portions we don't, do not know? I would suggest that we are still in the early adopter phase of this technology. And we haven't really reached you know, broad adoption and that is perhaps okay. It is perhaps okay because I think laser has reached this peak of inflated expectations and is on this downhill slope right now. We will reach a place, this plateau of productivity. This is Gardner's hype cycle applied to laser ablation in this case. And I suspect that many of us are getting there earlier than others. We know when to use it and what to expect from it. We've all had failures. We've all had patients who we had to take back do more ablations, or in my case, do temporal lobectomies on. And, um, you know, the patient often then themselves say, wish, I just wish I had had this done earlier. Uh, and I know that that is not necessarily mainstream thinking yet, but there I think are cases that are probably better dealt with even for dominant temporal of epilepsy with a temporal lobectomy up front. Uh, you know, we've created some software for optimized targeting of the hippocampus and uh, for SEG planning. We use that now in order to uh, make sure that we are able to get to the, uh, the structures that we care about uh, most effectively and, uh, and in a definitive way. This is derived from our own 100 patient uh, experience of laser ablation and using their trajectories to create this projected ablation volume 
uh, based just on how much it spread in all the other cases at each point along the hippocampus and, and use that then to guide uh, the actual placement of the operating room. Of course, that, that is a suggestion that our software will produce and the surgeon then is in charge of uh, burying it around these frustra to, to optimize placement. Uh, the software is called Encompass. We look forward to getting it in people's hands uh, later this year. All right, so with this, uh, I'm gonna just suggest that there are many other types of epilepsies and that's Bob's talk. And here's Bob, myself, uh, Ashok Gowda, um, uh, years ago uh, at a reception with uh, Ashok, who's the founder of Visual Ace and Ash Mehta. I think we were the earliest users of this technique. And here are three of my patients who did very well with laser ablation, except the middle one recently had a temporal lobectomy. And uh, she's now eight months from the temporal lobectomy and is seizure free. She's still working as a cardiology uh, angio room technician. Uh, so it is not incompatible uh, with, uh, with work, uh, temporal lobectomy. This is our group that really is fantastic, enables us to do all the work we do uh, in our lab and, and, the, uh, and the support from our university and our institute that enables this to happen. So that's all I got. I'm sorry I've run way over, Arthur. Apologies. Um, and uh, Thank you. We... Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to go ahead with Bob's presentation for the participants. They can put uh, their questions in the chat or a Q&A uh, icon of, uh, of this Zoom presentation. Uh, Bob is known to be pushing forward the uh, lead uh, uh, over the last uh, years, and he's going to be talking on the borderlands of epilepsy surgery, uh, laser ablation at the apex of the hype cycle. Uh, Bob, please go ahead. Bob, you're muted. It, it, yeah, it, it will be useful if you un unmute. Otherwise, it's. Uh... Oh, here you go. Okay. The picture thank is you. worth a thousand words. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Artur and, uh, and Guy and uh, Jorge and all the other organizers uh, for doing this wonderful service to the community um, and uh, for inviting me. I, uh, and giving me the opportunity to share our experience. So, so thank you, uh, Nathan, uh, um, for um, queuing it up um, because indeed um, uh, I'm going to talk about where we are in that hype cycle uh, as we get out towards that uh, right side of the curve. Um, I do have um, uh, some conflicts to disclose, in particular Medtronic, um, who I've been working with for many years on this technology um, and who both provides consulting and research support. Uh, there are many people that have contributed to all the work I'm going to show you uh, over the years, medical students, residents, fellows, uh, our very large neurology team, uh, apologies if I left anybody out, uh, and in particular, my uh, uh, long partner, John Willey, um, who stayed on after his fellowship with us, and uh, which started, his fellowship really coincided with the onset of laser ablation in our group in 2011, uh, and now is off on his own at uh, Wash U St. Louis. So indeed, um, you know, we start with laser and these are the two founders uh, or uh, two people, one founder, Asha Gowder from on the left from um, Visual Ace and we have the hype cycle and we started this in 2010 and it had a very, very quick adoption uh, over the years. Um, but of course, when you have a hammer, all things look like nails. So the question really becomes, where are we in that hype cycle uh, that Nitin uh, described? Um, I'm going to refer to a poster that we presented at uh, AES uh, um, th um, two and a half years ago um, when one of my colleagues uh, looking at the poster said to, uh, to, to me, you guys forgot to operate. Um, and, uh, you know, that might be true. Indeed, we, we do still operate sometimes uh, uh, when we get the opportunity. Um, but as I responded in the process of, uh, um, we are in the process of forgetting how to do open surgery in a sense. Um, and it could happen to anybody as this uh, gets adopted across the community. But really, maybe we need to redefine what it means to operate. Uh, really, the goal of operation is to achieve uh, an improved quality of life for our patients. Uh, 
And I'll just start with this um, patient um, who's fairly typical, uh, a left-handed right hemisphere dominant woman uh, who we mapped uh, with stereo EG and we found uh, onsets in her dominant frontal lobe, um, but they were broad. Um, and despite our best targeting, we maybe would do a better job these days. Um, this was a couple, couple of years ago. Uh, and they were, uh, the onsets were theta rather than low voltage fast activity. And we proposed a larger open resection for her, thinking that that was the best uh, therapy for her. In fact, you can see in the bottom right um, where I uh, drew on the board for this patient and her family, um, what our plans were uh, on a subsequent admission for doing a resection. Unfortunately, uh, um, there's, uh, it takes two to tango uh, and the patient and the family uh, have a big say in this. And the patient was emphatic in stating she would not return for a brain resection and was never interested in that. And basically said, you either do a laser ablation um, now or you won't get to, to treat me. Uh, and that was actually uh, on the Thursday before that AES meeting uh, that I referred to. Uh, so our plan being dominant uh, um, was to do radio frequency ablation originally, uh, monitor overnight, uh, and then uh, I managed to organize the lit for the following day, which is not very easy to do based on logistics. Um, and we said, okay, well, we'll go ahead and, and do the best we can in the context of what this patient uh, and her family were willing to accept. Um, so using the stereo EEG trajectories that I already had in place uh, and the um, twist drill holes associated with that, I introduced the laser fiber down each one of the relevant ones and maximized the ablation using those uh, um, uh, techniques that uh, Nitin described uh, to try to achieve what I might have achieved with an open resection. And you can see in the bottom left that uh, uh, there is some semblance of this, but, but certainly we were limited by the missing electrodes because uh, we did not have trajectories uh, in the places where uh, their onset may well have uh, been involved with. Um, she's had no generalized seizures in the two years since then, uh, but does continue after a quiescent period to have focal impaired awareness seizures, but is still refusing uh, any further surgery. So, so we have to really uh, embrace the concept of, of uh, acceptability within our community. So there are certain technical aspects of this and what I'm going to describe. I just want to get out of the way in the beginning. Um, so laser ablation can be performed without stereo EEG. Um, as a de novo procedure, as, uh, as Dr. Tandon described. It can also be done following SEEG as a de novo procedure in a delayed, or rather as a separate procedure in a delayed fashion. Or you can do it immediately, as I just showed you in that uh, previous patient. And we can also incorporate at times radio frequency ablation, which as we know, the European community and others have been using for many, many years um, in, in both testing function, as well as uh, basically seeing if we, uh, if we um, can kick the seizures in the butt. If we have a quiescent period, it is another form of data to support uh, that we're in the right area. We do prefer in my center to use the stereotactic platform, the MRI stereotactic platform, uh, in this case from ClearPoint, to enable us to target as well as we can in each case and to modify it on the fly. Uh, but we also use the robot at times and the anchor, and the anchor bolts, the laser bolts, uh, with obese patients, it can be very difficult to do this MRI-based uh, procedure, and sometimes our hands are forced. And also, with if you're doing four or five trajectories, as you'll see in some subsequent cases, uh, it can be very laborious to use the MRI targeting frame. And then this is the technique, uh, which I'll go into a little bit more detail, of, of being able to use the bolts that are already in place from the stereo EEG uh, in the MRI environment. Um, so we really have a great opportunity in our community uh, with the advent and moving across the pond of stereo EEG at basically the same time as we had the advent of MR guided uh, uh, lit to have a completely minimally invasive approach. Uh, some of the times we can do this through an SEEG bolt uh, that we introduce the laser fiber through. This is a larger bolt. It's actually no longer provided by Medtronic, but I believe PMT has one, um, but it does not accommodate the reduced diameter uh, uh, electrodes that we prefer to use. But at times we, when we have a very strong hypothesis, we can do stereo EG and then put the laser fiber right through that bolt. Uh, in this case, this patient had a radio frequency ablation and you can see the difference between an RF ablation uh, and a laser ablation, uh, which uh, as, as Nitin described, uh, can encompass far greater volumes. 
Um, but RF is useful in certain situations. This is a case of a patient with a focal cortical dysplasia uh, in the left um, subcentral region, as uh, Nitin described, and just uh, posterior to her Broca's area, uh, where I was not willing to just do a laser ablation, which in, almost invariably has to be done asleep. Um, so we introduced the um, bolts and uh, and put the you know, we used those laser bolts and did um, some. Uh, um, electrographic recording, established the onset zone, then we're able to test for function, uh, both with stimulation and with radiofrequency ablation while she was awake, uh, before we proceeded to, uh, to a laser ablation, uh, which I then did much more comfortably knowing that our basically trial ablations with RFA um, were tolerated well. Sometimes we plan a radiofrequency ablation and plan to go on to laser ablation, but it's not necessary. Uh, this is a case of a 43-year-old man with a um, thrombotic uh, um, stroke that had epilepsy emanating from his motor cortex. Um, we, uh, we mapped him with a stereo EEG, identified the onset zone, which was coming right from his motor cortex, uh, did stimulation mapping, which he actually tolerated pretty well, and then did RF ablation with him awake at the bedside, which he tolerated well as well. We then brought him down to the scanner and looked at the types of ablations that we had. And I recognized that we really had sufficient amount of ablation just from RFA. And I was not willing to do any larger ablation with stereotactic laser ablation. Uh, in this place, uh, patient, we felt it was sufficient. He's actually been seizure-free with RFA alone uh, for over four years with only a mild exacerbation of his pre-op hemiparesis. So this allows us to tailor the procedures a little bit better. This is a patient who underwent stereo EEG and radiofrequency ablation. Um, uh, this is on the non-dominant side. And sometimes we do RFA just because the electrodes are there and there's no good reason not to. Um, but I planned on doing this and then um, uh, doing an open resection at a later time. Uh, but she had a flurry of seizures post ablation day one, uh, which we recorded on stereo EEG. And so we decided to laser ablate right through the stereo EEG holes uh, that were there um, on the following Monday um, with a plan for further resection if needed. Um, and this is how that technique is done. We basically have uh, our bolts, uh, the an typical anchor bolts from whatever uh, manufacturer you're using. Um, we remove the caps in the sterile environment um, and then unscrew the bolts and then just slide the laser right down that trajectory. Now this can only be done when you have, uh, um, when there's no vascularity in the area because obviously this is not as accurate uh, as the typical procedures we do. And I certainly would never do this with a deep structure uh, like the insula. Um, this is, uh, shows uh, how we do this in the MRI environment and we have to work around the, uh, the coils, uh, which we need, which makes it a little bit challenging, but this is, um, shows one of my fellows introducing the laser fiber in the sterile environment um, of the, uh, um, of the um, uh, MRI scanner. So again, this requires a sterile MRI environment, uh, which you can do in an IMRIS. In our case, we have an interventional MRI scanner, uh, which is an MRI scanner set up as an operating room. And this is how that ablation then looked in that patient. Um, and she has been seizure-free for over two years. So as uh, Nitin uh, mentioned, there's different targets, uh, different types of epilepsy associated onsets. And so these are the nails uh, that our hammers uh, can look for. And I'll go through uh, each of these in turn. Um, hypothalamic hamartomas is the, almost the ideal application of uh, laser ablation, a deep target and one associated with complications from open surgery and also from gamma knife as well as the delay. Uh, and this is the beautiful work of Dan Curry, who is really the first adopter of all of us of this laser ablation therapy uh, for uh, epilepsy. Uh, and he talked about this uh, uh, a few months ago, so I won't talk about this any further. Um, an early publication from uh, um, Nitten's group uh, looking at this in periventricular nodular heterotopia, another very beautiful application because this is an area where uh, the collateral damage associated with getting to the target is greater than the damage uh, of, of ablating the target. Uh, and uh, so he published this uh, case report um, establishing the usefulness of this technique. Um, and this is a, a patient we did a, about a year ago who had bilateral periventricular nodular heterotopias, as you can see here, patient underwent stereo EG uh, mapping. Um, and I did uh, attempt, or I did RFA in that patient and, and planned for a subsequent procedure. Um, and indeed the, the RFA had very little impact, continued to have seizures. And so he underwent laser ablation, uh, which is in this case, 
um, um, more ideal to come from different trajectories than we used for, uh, for um, stereo EEG. So stereo EEG and laser don't necessarily use uh, or have the same optimized trajectories. Uh, so we came in with two posterior trajectories. Um, we're considering a more anterior one if needed. Uh, and this is done with the, the uh, clear point. Um, and you can see that uh, um, we were able to get a very nice ablation uh, of the uh, mapped uh, um, uh, periventricular nodule heterocopy, and he's been seizure free for greater than a year. Um, this is another patient with a periventricular nodular heterotopia um, who had um, uh, um, goosebumps, uh, although these, uh, or at least a subjective feeling of goosebumps at onset. Um, and uh, this was associated with theta at uh, this particular 13, number 13 electrode. And we actually could stimulate both the seizure and goosebumps uh, with stimulating at that, that spot and at no other spots. And so we did an RF ablation with that electrode right in place. And you can see we get a pretty good ablation with RFA, um, but not perfect because we are confined to the trajectory that we had, which is not necessarily optimal. Uh, this patient was um, seizure free uh, after going, having daily seizures, multiple daily seizures, was seizure free for two weeks. So this is where the uh, demonstration of being able to kick the seizures in the butt establishes that we are on the seizure circuit. Um, and this patient then came back and underwent uh, a more optimized and separate uh, laser ablation um, just a couple of weeks ago. And you can see um, that uh, we can, using the um, clear point system, be able to look at what we've obtained and change on the fly and decide that we need another trajectory uh, to have an optimal anatomical result. This is a, a, a patient of John's uh, who had also a, um, a clear point approach uh, after stereo EEG. Um, and this is uh, in the insula. So the insula is the next great target uh, for using laser ablation, because as you know, the complications from insular surgery generally come more from the, uh, from the opening than for the actual resection of the, of the uh, insula. So here we can do a trajectory that comes, while we might map it orthogonally from, uh, with uh, stereo EEG, we can come from a more um, uh, reasonable approach uh, for laser ablation from above. Uh, and here John did three uh, tracks uh, with the clear point system uh, and was able to get a very good result. Um, this has been uh, studied nicely by uh, uh, Dave Clark's group, um, um, and uh, um, they published uh, several years ago now 20 uh, pediatric patients uh, that had insular surgery. Um, and you can uh, see that you can do it in various different ways and come from various different approaches. Um, and they had 50% uh, angle one at seven to 32 months uh, follow-up. So a fairly nice result. So let's turn now to medial frontal and, and parietal. So medial frontal is another good target for laser ablation um, because sometimes it can be quite um, challenging, uh, although we enjoy it, but uh, with, the, with the frontal veins and so forth to get down to um, the cingulate region in particular. Um, so this is a, a patient with a, a pregenual cingulate focal cortical dysplasia that underwent, uh, you can see the cortical dysplasia over here and underwent stereo EEG uh, localization. Um, and then uh, um, underwent uh, laser ablation through the SEEG holes uh, that were available. And we've, we calculated that we could do a fairly nice job based on this. And one can begin with the end in mind. And in certain situations where there's a known lesion, you can actually tailor your SEEG so that it accommodates doing a laser ablation on the same admission uh, and not having to delay and bring the patient back. So we are able to do that uh, using five different trajectories uh, coming through these bolts. Uh, achieved a nice uh, anatomical result, um, and the patient has been seizure-free for uh, greater than two years off all meds. Um, now, sometimes uh, we do RFA, but sometimes, as I mentioned, we don't. This is a case where uh, you can see that there's a vascularity, there's, there's a cingulate vessel coming right up to the area where we mapped out uh, cingulate onsets um, in the mid cingulate region. And so I was unwilling to do radio frequency ablation in this particular case for that reason in the mid cingulate region. Um, and so, similarly, uh, putting in the laser fiber uh, would be too close to this uh, medial vessel uh, to do a SLA uh, on the same admission. And so we brought the patient back um, for a um, dorsal approach uh, to the mid-cingulate and I was able to get a good result here uh, in the mid-cingulate region. 
Um, the, uh, this is a, a patient of John's that uh, shows um, being able to come down and get the SMA as well as the cingulate from a dorsal approach. In this case, again, knowing what he might want to do um, from the beginning, uh, took a, a dorsal approach for stereo EG in a very non-classical way, uh, not orthogonal, uh, but this enabled him to uh, take advantage of this for doing SLA on the same uh, admission. Um, so. Sometimes uh, um, we do an RFA and we, and we want to proceed on, but, uh, but we don't get the opportunity. This is a patient with a um, SMA and uh, cingulate onset, uh, as, uh, as shown on the left side. Um, and um, we did radiofrequency ablation to those electrodes um, and uh, plan for a subsequent resection. Uh, again, like that first case I showed, uh, resection would seem to be the best plan for her rather than lit, but, uh, and she is game for it. But uh, so although she's been seizure free for three months, um, she still has troubling arm negative motor um, auras, uh, um, if you will. I mean, simple partial seizures uh, without impairing awareness, uh, but uh, the parents are very ambivalent about further surgery at all and uh, um, uh, are seeking further medication, but I suspect we'll be seeing this patient back at a later time. This is a useful technique for the orbital and lateral frontal cortex as well. This is the case I showed you uh, in the beginning um, with, uh, uh, that we uh, did uh, that had a flurry of seizures after RFA. Um, and you can see that we very nicely can get to the orbital frontal region uh, with uh, laser, uh, which again is a, a larger craniotomy uh, in order to, um, to get to. And if you were doing this on the left side, uh, certainly coming through uh, Broca's region um, can be challenging. Um, so this patient underwent, as I mentioned already, uh, RFA and is seizure free at two years. And you can really carry this to, to the borderlands, if you will. Uh, how, how far will you, are you willing to go with this? So this is a case that John did recently that he was very nice to share with me. A patient who had a uh, right frontal craniotomy for a WHO grade two meningioma, was treated with radiation, had a very attenuated scalp, uh, and was not uh, interested in, in open surgery. So after stereo EEG, um, he, uh, he then... Uh, Okay. Um, then uh, planned a uh, essentially a topectomy or topotomy of the frontal uh, premotor opercular region and the orbital frontal cortexes. Uh, and then he did this. Um, uh, this happened to respect uh, uh, positivity in this area, uh, but he made trajectories that look like this. Um, and then came in, uh, and you can see the previous uh, um, damage from the resection, and he ablated five trajectories encompassing all active SEEG contacts. Uh, the patient was admitted to the ICU uh, afterwards, but it had no neuro new neurological deficits and was discharged post-operative day two. So you can really um, uh, simulate a craniotomy um, with a fairly extensive use of laser uh, in this case. So this is definitely in the borderland side of things. Um, this is a patient of, of mine that had uh, previously underwent craniotomy for grid strips and depths, and then a reoperation, and then ANT DBS, as you can see here. Um, and although we actually could see that the ANT was, was suppressing his seizures, because in the EMU during stereo EG, and we turned off his ANT, he had a, a flurry of seizures, uh, and his wife be begged us to turn it back on. But nevertheless, he obviously had an insufficiently good result that he was undergoing further study. Um, and uh, so we did radio frequency. We mapped out this parietal region, which continued to be his onset zone. Um, I did radio frequency ablation in this area and then brought him down to the scanner um, and was dissatisfied in this case with the coverage that I had with RF through the uh, um, depth electrodes and wanted to be able to uh, enlarge these lesions to get an overlapping region, which I then did over four or five different trajectories. Um, and uh, that patient, um, uh, unfortunately, has not had a seizure-free outcome from that uh, alone. We recently uh, published uh, these extratemporal lobe epilepsy outcomes um, uh, in epilepsia, uh, and uh, you can see the results uh, are um, fairly good uh, with um, Engel uh, class one um, uh, coming out uh, in, the, in the long term. Uh, at about 50% uh, or slightly greater than 50%. So this, of course, is a conglomeration of different patients with different predictors of good outcomes. Turning to the temporal region, um, uh, uh, this, of course, is a broad region. You've heard much about the mesial temporal area, and I won't belabor that point at all. Uh, this is a case of John's uh, where he was able to do a topotomy 
um, uh, coming from behind uh, of the uh, inferior temporal uh, um, gyrus or um, and uh, and part of the um, uh, middle temporal gyrus. Uh, and so uh, this is a case which is can be quite challenging when you come from this lateral approach. We have a lot of obliquity. Uh, and these are good cases to do with the uh, clear point system because uh, it's this it's very easy to have a deviation um, of the of the bolt um, coming from this type of trajectory. It's also quite easy with the MRI with the uh, clear point system as well, but at least we can adjust on the fly. Um, we've applied this to uh, the anterior temporal region. Um, uh, this is a patient with a low-grade epilepsy-associated tumor um, who's done very well for a number of years. Um, and again, this is on the left side. He, uh, we managed to not have any uh, um, naming difficulties, which also localizes to the temporal pole, as we found in our group with uh, uh, Dan Drain. Um, and every year I see him and, and suggest we could get rid of his last seizure, um, but he says open resection was never an option he would consider. Um, so uh, we are in the process of uh, publishing um, our uh, LEAT series uh, and um, comparing it to open resections and proximally equal, obviously statistically indistinguishable results as far as the outcomes of, of these patients. Um, the temporal bowl can be quite challenging, um, and so uh, coming from lateral, uh, you have all the musculature and a lot of uh, um, deflection, um, but we can incorporate lateral as well as posterior trajectories to get to the temporal pole uh, fairly, fairly nicely, um, whether it's uh, from uh, focal cortical dysplasia or cryptogenic onset or even for encephaloceles. Um, and uh, we can even extend this uh, a little further. So here, John published a paper uh, last year, um, basically doing an anterior temporal lobectomy um, with, with laser fibers. Um, so in this case, he used five or six uh, laser fibers that were planned out. We use the O-arm to check uh, these uh, trajectories. We sterilely package this patient for incorporation down in the scanner, as I showed you before, and then sequentially go from one to the other uh, through these coils, uh, which again, can be challenging, but you have a, a very good cosmetic result. Um, and uh, this shows uh, each of these ablations, uh, um, mesial, um, coming from that more posterior lateral approach, uh, and then lateral coming to the uh, getting to the anterior uh, portion, and and just uh, you know what, whatever it takes. This has to be planned out very carefully ahead of time. Uh, this is the result on CT and result on MRI. Uh, the surgery uh, took obviously longer than it would take to do an anterior temporal lobectomy. Patient had a quadrant, which is not unexpected, um, and had uh, hemifacial paresis. Um, which actually was due to um, uh, enhancement of the nerve uh, that eventually resolved by 12 months uh, and focal impaired awareness seizures continued, uh, but there's a question of PNES in this patient. Uh, and by 12 months, the focal impaired awareness seizures had resolved. So we used this early on for cavernous malformations as well. Um, and uh, this shows the process of doing that. Uh, cavernous malformations are challenging because the GRE signal um, which is what we use for, thermo for thermography, um, can obliterate uh, the thermography. So we sometimes uh, have to, if we're lucky, we get some, some uh, a thermal map that goes around the external part of this uh, uh, cav mal, which allows us to develop a uh, damage zone estimate. But sometimes uh, the, the um, artifact is so large, we actually have to perform it in an open loop fashion without using thermal mapping and just using our experience. Uh, so we published this paper uh, initially on our first few patients a number of years ago, and then on our larger series of 19 patients. Um, this is uh, an example of why this can be so useful. Uh, this is a uh, college student who had a uh, cav mal in the dominant posterior temporal region. Um, and this is, has its challenging challenges in terms of getting to with an open technique um, and not causing any uh, language related or memory related deficits. So I was able to laser ablate uh, in, this, in this area here. Um, and uh, again, it was difficult to visualize, which can, can create its uh, um, limitations. Um, you wanna try to get the hemosiderin ring 
Um, and uh, the post-operative imaging often looks just like the pre-operative imaging. So it's not kind of hard to tell what you've gotten when you've, when you've done it, um, which has its challenges. And there's an extension to the point at which you may not want to do this. This is uh, a patient with a two centimeter um, uh, cav mal on the right side in the same region. Uh, someone I'm, I'm very reluctant to actually do with the laser. Um, we're actually doing stereo EEG to, to try to identify the onset zone, and we may be able to laser just that onset zone. Um, but if, if a greater area is involved, this is clearly some patient, uh, patient that we'll be doing in an open uh, fashion. This is a dentist who had a cav mal uh, in, the, in the central sulcus um, and was not willing, nor, nor was I excited about doing open surgery. And this is one of the few patients that we did awake in the scanner uh, to actually check his, his hand function uh, while we were doing the ablation. He had some transient hand weakness, but returned to work and his angle one uh, outcome. Uh, this is our larger series of 19 patients um, of whom 82% uh, were angle one. Uh, and uh, um, there were no adverse effects related to hemorrhages in this epilepsy associated tumor series. The same cannot be said uh, of uh, our series of patients that have uh, cav mouths that presented for other reasons. And then I'll just close with uh, laser callosotomy, first performed by uh, Dan Curry down at Texas Children's, several published case reports. Um, this is um, in some ways an ideal technique uh, for this. You can do an anterior uh, two thirds callosotomy um, and uh, um, many of the complications that come from callosotomy, although not all, uh, come from uh, doing the uh, interhemispheric approach. Um, and uh, so it it's, uh, can be laborious. We may need um, two or three fibers sometimes, even for an anterior two thirds. Um, and uh, um, you can also not do a completion callosotomy, which is a great use for this in a previously operated field. Um, we found that um, uh, our clear point uh, has a lower radial error than the ROSA. So I kind of might bet what uh, um, uh, Dr. Tandon said about the accuracy, but really the problem uh, comes from the distance. Uh, it's amplified because of the distance of the trajectory um, and the possibility for deflections uh, in these cases. So we have had uh, a complication or two when using the ROSA um, uh, due to deflections and, and cingulate vessels in that area. And that's reported in our paper, um, which is it's actually no longer in press. It got published a, a month or so ago. Uh, and the outcomes in that are similar to the outcomes from our open procedures. Um, uh, as, as shown here, majority of patients with greater than 50% improved resolved astatic atonic seizures and one clinically significant medial frontal hemorrhage. So I will close now um, with saying that there are many ways to skin a cat. Uh, all of them are messy in, in their own particular way. Uh, in particular, laser uh, offers the ability to do minimal disruption of tissues, essentially the narrow corridor uh, um, uh, that uh, has, has been discussed um, by Roten and others uh, in, in approach. So it, it validates you use uh, um, approaches that we use for open surgery. Uh, we can just get a much narrower corridor uh, with this minimally invasive approach and thereby have decreased collateral damage, less surgical morbidity, pain, length of stay. Uh, it's easily coupled to stereo EG uh, uh, these days. Uh, and it does lead to increased acceptance and referrals, especially for patients that are refusing open surgery, like the couple that I mentioned, uh, which is really happening more and more, either because we're poisoning the waters by telling them about laser ablation ahead of time, or more likely we're bringing more patients in for invasive monitoring because of the minimally invasive aspect of stereo EG as compared to grids. Uh, so we're kind of cutting the line between patients that are willing to go so far as, as an open surgery, um, but not willing, I'm sorry, as a, as a minimally invasive surgery, but not to go so far as to an open surgery. And with that, I will close. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Uh, we have time for discussion and uh, quite, a, quite a lot of uh, questions. I, I know that knitting has been active in uh, answering some through the chat, but uh, since they are uh, quite important, I will ask you, Nitin and, and Bob, to answer to them again, if needed. So the first one would be given the longer trajectory. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, I, I invited Massimo, Dan, and Riz to join the panel. I hope they are still there. I, they, they are allowed to talk, and I will try to allow them to appear. So 
be ready for that. So given the long trajectory of importance to place the laser probe at the target and high accuracy, how do you overcome the problem with like a free hand placement of the anchoring boat in order to avoid angular deviation? Any trick from you two? Um, I think you're referring to the technique that I was describing. Um, the um, first of all, with the anchor bolt in place, if you're using a laser bolt, uh, so-called laser bolt, um, like is had been available from AdTech and I believe is still available from PMT, um, then the accuracy of the laser insertion should be similar to the accuracy of the depth electrode insertion because it is a stereotactic surrogate. Um, sometimes we can actually play with that a little bit. If we know we want to get a little bit more anterior or superior, you can actually unscrew the bolt a little bit and do a little bit of uh, wiggle. Um, uh, you know, I used to call this the willy wiggle when he was in my center um, and, uh, um, and, and get actually take advantage of some inaccuracy. But you would only do this uh, live um, uh, with MR visualization in an interventional or IMRA scanner. Um, and in an area where there are no vessels that are nearby and at risk. Uh, similarly, with taking the bolt out and doing it through the, the hole, you know, not all twistral craniostomies are the same. A twistral craniostomy in the temporal region through the squamous uh, has very little stereotactic um, uh, uh, tolerance. Um, uh, so you can get a lot of wiggle through that and that is more dicey. You can avail yourself of that, uh, but it's very challenging in that area, especially because of the temporalis musculature. But as you move further back into thicker bone and less musculature, uh, then the accuracy of putting the laser fiber through that stereotactic hole is actually quite good. Um, and again, you're always taking into account uh, um, the vascularity in that area. Um, but, and, and I recommend doing that under continuous imaging. Yeah. Would you like to add something, Nitin? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's inaccuracies, <clears throat> uh, there's a potential for inaccuracies at all points. And uh, it's not just that the placement of the anchor board, I think how you drill, um, how um, consistent you are with uh, checking all your, your trajectories, uh, your, your, you know, your coordinates, all of that matters. But I think uh, the specific question is, you know, that anchor board that Medtronic provides is free-handed in. And, um, I think if you have a guide rod that is held in place by the Sockman reducing tubes, uh, as you place the, uh, the anchor board, you're much less likely to make it. Okay, so let, let's move to the next one. Uh, that one was directed uh, to you, but maybe uh, the others from the panel could join. Uh, Nitin, you mentioned towards the end of your talk that perhaps, so, uh, and again, Nitin, I know that you work hard answering them through the chat, but it's so important yeah, yeah, no, for the have, audience. Have uh, yeah. Okay, so you mentioned towards the end of your talk that perhaps you, some patients with dominant TLE may be better served by resection rather than by laser ablation. Assuming you are speaking of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, I'm wondering what distinguished this group of patients. Would you elaborate on that? Yeah, so uh, I think there's, there's three or four groups, and I've alluded to them here. Uh, you know, people with a long duration of epilepsy. So, you know, we all see these individuals at 50 years old who had a febrile convulsion at the age of nine months, was then seizure free on phenobarbital uh, till they turned 14, and then their seizures started. They started having complex blocked seizures, and, and they've had now epilepsy for 35 years. Um, in most of those cases, the seizure networks are likely larger. Now, we don't have, again, just to be the, the, the caveat here is that so much of this pre selection happens across centers anyway that I don't have a comparison group. My neurologist and myself would probably not put that person through a laser ablation with 35 or 40 year history of uh, what appears to be hippocampal sclerosis. Of course, if the patient is only gonna accept one thing, then that is what, what uh, we would give them. But our bias would be more towards saying, look, you likely have a bigger seizure network. And this is often also indexed by their imaging, which shows significant ipsilateral temporal lobe atrophy. Uh, and that atrophy is, is a marker of, uh, of likely bidirectional pathways that are now uh, engaged in uh, seizure dentistry. Um, that patient also usually has had a naming decline and is often more disabled by that long-term epilepsy 
than somebody who's had a four-year history or eight-year history of epilepsy. So those, you know, all of that usually belongs to one type of patient cohort. So, Bob, are there people that are better candidates for resections other than laser ablation, or every temporal lobe epilepsy is better treated by laser ablation? Um, well, you know, we're, we're hopefully we'll develop the predictive analytics that will answer that question through trials like SLATE. Um, so, um, you know, we don't have the opportunity to answer all questions in surgery um, because of our slow, uh, our low numbers. And so some of the times we have to bring in some of um, these theoretical um, and other considerations as uh, Nitin was referring to. Um, but we don't really know the answer. That's one of the problems. We turns out, uh, I like to say, neuro, functional neurosurgeons are always right, but for the wrong reasons. Um, and so I would like to find that out. Um, in, in my center, however, um, if, if there's any question as to the semiology um, being discordant uh, um, from the electrophysiology and from the imaging, then uh, we are much more inclined to do stereo EEG uh, these days in those patients and, and identify uh, that network and then move from there. Uh, the resection that I put up in the beginning I did the other day is just such a patient uh, who turned out to have a broader network involving the right temporal lobe. And so that patient is much more well-suited um, to doing a resection. Although as we understand, you know, we can do anything with a laser that we can do with a bipolar and a, suc and a sucker. Um, so uh, that, that type of patient, as we understand the network, even if it's a bigger network, uh, we can be more aggressive uh, with the laser and that's usually well tolerated. And Great. the final point I'll make is that we do have to try to identify those patients that we will not get a second chance at. Some patients are, are you know, will, will say, yes, I will come back. I will come, I'll have a repeat laser or I'll have an open resection if this doesn't work. And sometimes we just don't get that second shot on goal. Um, and, uh, and in that case, uh, we've really done a disservice to the patient. So as we can try to identify those patients where we only get one shot, I think uh, we have to um, do the highest uh, likelihood procedure. Thanks, Bob. Any, any input from the rest of the panel? I, I see that guy has a hands up si sign. I don't, did you, did you? Yeah, yeah. So I actually, I, I had one comment just to echo what, what both Nitin and Bob said, and then I actually had a follow up question for both of them. So I think the comment is what you both said, which is that there are a lot of patients who are unwilling to undergo anterior temporal surgery, who maybe like you say, like you say, Nitin, you think that they are a higher risk of failure from laser, but a lot of patients, at least in our practice say, well, you're not gonna get a shot at open surgery unless you prove to me first that laser isn't gonna work because they realize how less morbid it is. And then a lot of patients ask also, as Bob, as you said, then they come back and they say afterwards, oh, well, okay, it didn't work. I'm better, but I'm not seizure free. Now I'm willing to undergo temporal lobectomy, whereas I wasn't before. Um, but my question for both of you, because you both talked about, and we've looked at it also, patients who, who actually have fairly good neuropsychological function, who you localize them with mesial onsets with stereo EEG, what do you tell them about their neuropsychological, neurocognitive risk of ablation of a non-MTS hippocampus? And what's been your experience in that particular population? Yeah, so um, maybe I can go first, Bob. Um, well, let, let me just tell you that you have many questions. So if you can answer each question in a quick way so we can move to, uh, otherwise it's gonna stuck with dozens of questions. Thank you. Sure. So. Uh, and I think before we go further, in the patients that undergo SEEG, I think it is crucial to make certain that you have working and well-sampled temporal polar cover. Because one of the reasons that the failure happens, and this was in my earlier years of doing SEEG, was I was not always as consistent with that temporal polar electrode as I am today. Okay, so that's just one important point. You cannot evaluate a patient where there is potential hippocampal epilepsy, not evaluate the temporal. Secondly, um, I don't think there's any doubt that that patient that you described, Guy, is going to take a decline. Uh, and that decline is going to be of the same type as we see with the temporal lobectomy in some ways, uh, minus the deficiency in name retrieval. But the memory deficits can be 
you know, worse, just as bad. No, I shouldn't say worse. They seem worse now because we've gotten so far away from doing this in non-lethal cases with an open resection. Um, but uh, it, it's also combined, and I don't know if uh, anybody else can talk at this point, it's also combined with emotional disturbance in these non-lesional mesial uh, ablations. I've seen that not infrequently. Uh, we actually have now a psychiatrist seeing every limbic ablation or resection for that reason. Because anxiety and depression are very common in this cohort, both before and after resection. But I do tell them, you're going to, you know, there's two parts. It's not just memory, it's learning as well. And the hippocampus is first a learning structure and then a memory structure. So if they have scholastic work to learn, if they have, uh, um, you know, particular uh, skills that they need to keep acquiring over a lifetime that are verbal, uh, it's likely that they will fail at doing so in the future. All right, I'll just briefly address that. I partly agree and partly disagree. Um, so, so I totally agree that um, we can't get away from the memory deficits of such a patient who usually starts with an intact memory if we're talking about the dominant side. Um, and that's, uh, those patients are much more likely to do RNS uh, and prove that it doesn't work first or maybe DBS um, before I buy the memory deficit associated with that. Um, but we can get rid of the naming deficit associated with uh, open surgery. So we've published that a number of years ago, um, that in open surgery, it's a, it's a very, you know, 90% chance of a naming deficit. Doesn't matter what type of open surgery you do. Um, whereas with the laser uh, patients in those 19 patients, we had no naming deficits whatsoever. Um, we do think that the memory deficit is less, although we haven't uh, really proven that well. Um, uh, when you just do a laser ablation, because there are those other structures that are involved in memory. Um, and as long as you preserve those memory structures, they can actually work through the contralateral side. Uh, so, uh, but, but we are very disinclined to do a first procedure laser ablation of a normal hippocampus on the dominant side. That's not true about the contralateral side. Thank you both. Uh, I noticed, Massimo, that you have a question to both speakers. Maybe you would like to put it up uh, live, if you, you have to unmute, unmute first. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Avro. Um, I was re really impressed uh, about the large volumes uh, of ablations uh, in areas uh, which are very uh, crowded with uh, arterial branches as the insula or the mesial part of the, of the hemisphere. And uh, since I have experience with uh, uh, stereo AG ablations, uh, radio frequency ablations. Uh, uh, we put particular attention in uh, performing the coagulations uh, by avoiding to coagulate uh, contacts uh, which are uh, in, in close proximity of uh, branches. Uh, I see. Usually, we avoid to coagulate uh, within a, a radius, uh, an area with a radius of two, three millimeters around the center of the trajectory. So um, I will ask you to both uh, speakers, uh, how do they manage this issue to avoid damage to, to arterial branches? Yeah, I think in, in particular in, in the insula trajectories, uh, that's when we are most nervous, uh, for sure. Um, we, we've already found, though, that um, with the cav mals uh, with an associated DVA, that we can be very close uh, to a venous structure and not have any damage, no hemorrhage. Um, so there's, there's something about the laser ablation that might be more gentle with respect to um, the, the heating than the, uh, with RF. And I, I think, and this is not proven, um, first of all, as the laser ablation works by two techniques. It works by both photonic heating as well as thermal heating. So as tissue heats up, then you have thermal heating in a similar manner to RF ablation. Um, but I think with respect to photonic heating uh, that you, you reach these, these interfaces that have reflectivity uh, and the vessels uh, reflect off some of the photons so that they don't actually take up the heat as well as the parenchyma surrounding. And then as far as, um, uh, as, far as thermal conductivity, of course, the vessels are, um, that we're talking about here are protected by being in cisterns. Um, and that leads to very rapid wicking of the temperature. So we've gotten very, very close to those 
extremely important MCA branches uh, in the uh, insular region without having any hemorrhages. But I would hesitate, uh, but I would also point out that our N is not very high. Um, whether it's the 20 series published by uh, uh, Dave Clark or all of our series put together, we don't really know the true hemorrhage rate. Um, we could do the 21st patient uh, and have a hemorrhage and then your hemorrhage rate is 5%. Uh, so we have to be careful and still do this very carefully and study our results before we get so blithe as to say that uh, we're not going to have vascular complications. Thank you. I noticed, Riz, that you have a question uh, too, and maybe this should take advantage of the presence of both Bob and Massimo. Can you go ahead with your question, please? Yeah, uh, first of all, I commend uh, Bob and, and Neaton for it was great uh, for being leaders in this in this area. And um, um, so I guess I just wanted you to describe in more detail that, uh, you know, your technique for RF ablation through the SEEG electrodes, like what systems do you use? How does that uh, how do you do that? So uh, first of all, I mean, we are in an international meeting, uh, not in a national meeting, but I do have to caution that what I do with RFA in the United States is in no way, shape, manner, or form FDA approved. Um, so the Cosman generator is FDA approved for using with certain equipment, not for using with depth electrodes. And as yet, the depth electrodes that we have available to us are not uh, use, uh, approved for use with ablation. Um, so this is done on a patient by patient basis. And I explain to every patient in detail those facts and, and, and our experience and allow them to make that determination. And in each situation, you have to have a compelling reason why you're doing it. You're not doing it willy nilly um, and you're doing it for, uh, because for example, this is an area that I need to do live and have testing with you so that I know whether you're going to have a deficit uh, as I'm doing the heating as, as you're very well familiar. And then I have to jerry rig the system basically because there is no plug-in for the electrodes into the Cosman generator, which is what I use. So I use a thalamotomy probe um, that's basically been retired and I take advantage of the exposed tip and we basically stick it into the junction box. Um, and, uh, and on the other hand, the return can be, uh, the reference is, is the ref same reference that we use. So we just uh, systematically remove uh, the electrode from the junction box, um, validate that we're in the right spot on EEG, uh, put it in and it takes sometimes two fellows to hold it just right so it, <laughs> it doesn't lose contact. And um, we go sequentially one after the other. And then as far as the, the, the parameters, there's been a lot of work done in that and I've varied, but basically we take it to the limit because usually we're trying to get as much ablation as we can. So we have steam events, uh, the patient knows it, they tell it, the family can hear the, the popping outside the patient. Uh, um, so we know we're having steam events. Uh, and and uh, we don't seem to have any problems from that, and we can get reasonably big ablations when we when we take it to the limit. If there's a situation where there's a vessel nearby, as Massimo said, we're not we're not going to ablate there. Just not going to do it. Thank you. We are reaching our time limit. Uh, Massimo, would you like to give an European perspective on RF hysteriology uh, lesions before we close? And you have to unmute again. Thank you. All right. Thank you, but you know, um, especially the, uh, especially how you do it, not the results, but uh, how you yeah. do it. Yes, um, uh, basically we discuss the SCG results with our epileptologists, and they propose a number of coagulation according to the findings on stereo G. We usually include in the target area for RFA. RFA uh, um, the seizure on the zone, so the, uh, the areas which uh, uh, with uh, low voltage, low voltage uh, fast activity. And uh, the, uh, we exclude the areas with uh, uh, eloquent uh, cortex or structures as, uh, as emerging from the stimulation mapping, the functional mapping. And uh, we exclude the the, uh, as I said before, the areas which are in close proximity to important MCA branches or other branches of uh, main uh, brain arteries. Then uh, we um, select, uh, uh, we, we usually um, perform coagulation by uh, progressively increasing uh, 
the current power uh, up to uh, eight uh, uh, watts. And, what, what, uh, then, what, what, what time of equipment are you using for coagulation? We, we use um, a Cosmon generator, which is adapted for, uh, for this specific procedure because uh, we have to exclude the temperature feedback because the, the SEG electrodes that we use have no ter um, then term thermic sensors. So, uh, <laughs> and we usually, we, um, the, the coagulation time is uh, about 60, 90 seconds. And uh, uh, anyway, as long as uh, we, um, we, we, we see the, the, the impedance falling very abruptly. And uh, sometimes we have to repeat the procedure in the on the same two contiguous co uh, contacts because uh, the problem is then that uh, the uh, impedance may be not uh, uh, completely down. So this means that the lesion is not complete and we repeat the coagulation. And uh, usually uh, we, we discharge the patient the day after the coagulation with no, if he has no problems. In, in when we have very large uh, areas of coagulation, we administer steroids uh, as uh, required. Thank you. We are going to forward the, the rest of the questions to the lecturers, so and they are going to answer them to you uh, uh, over the next years. I'm going to just take advantage of being the moderator today, ask for a question for a very quick response from both of the presenters. Do, do you think the beauty of the procedure is because you're using a laser or because you are able to use thermography or both? 10 seconds for, every, for, for both of you. Uh, the laser definitely has greater uh, penetrance than other techniques like like RF, uh, but the thermography is the key to doing this safely and effectively because you can't get MR imaging of the damage you've done as you're doing it. So you rely on that predictive value of the damage zone estimate. Yeah, in, a, in, the, in the absence of uh, MR imaging, I think uh, there would be a lot of guesswork, if you will to know where you are and how far your ablation zone has gone. So the imaging is really what allows the technique to, to have this sort of therapeutic efficacy range where you, you're not hurting something and yet you're getting the desired lesion. Uh, Daniel, you're very quiet. Would you like to have a 10 second answer? Um, I, I just think that everything has been very well put by the presenters. Today, a lot of wisdom has been imparted. I don't think I have anything to add. Okay, thank you so much for everybody. Uh, we are finishing now and uh, we're looking forward to have you around for our next meeting that will deal with uh, eloquent area surgery. So thank you every for everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. And I am opening the room for the post-webinar meeting. Thank you.